Thank you. And I was asked by the organizers to say something about pressure scales and gauges. So this is something which you will be confront confronted maybe every day in your future career. How do I measure pressure and what is the accuracy of it? Uh, accuracy, it's not precision. Uh, I want to, the accuracy is the absolute value. How, how, what is the confidence I can have in this value which I measure? And this goes then from typically one kilobar to megabars. So I have to give you a health warning uh, right away. This talk is very basic. It's hands-on. It's for school. And for some of you it will be maybe a little bit trivial, but you come from different horizons, so I decided to make it uh, rather, um, rather simple. And I hope you can uh, uh, leave this, uh, this, this school and have, have learned something. So this is the, the, the a summary of my talk. I fir first uh, tell you what is pressure. Then I will talk about primary and sec secondary pressure gauges. I'll give you then a list of secondary pressure gauges, which you will certainly use in your lab laboratory, all of you, at one point. Then uh, at the end, I come back to primary pressure gauges. Uh, and I talk, I talk a little bit about ultrasonics and shock waves. And finally, I conclude with some remarks and, uh, on the precision uh, in high-pressure science and technology. So what is pressure? So everybody of you will immediately reply, it's force divided by surface. But this is probably what you, the last thing you which, which you want to do with your sample. That means if you apply a force to it and squeeze it and measure something, because you will measure no matter what. So what is, so let, let, let me go a little bit more into detail with it. So you have a, a sample which is the size of a cube, for example. It's, let's say it's uh, homogeneous and it's isotropic. Uh, and you apply a certain forces to it and you convert it from this to this and this gives you a volume change. So this is clearly something which you want to do in your future life. Uh, but man, if you change the, the forces and where you apply it, then you may end up with something like this. This also gives you a volume changes and it also uh, implies forces and, uh, and surfaces. And finally, you may get something like this. So uh, you clearly have a volume change, but you have also the uh, 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 change of the size, but also the <coughs> angles. So all these things apply forces and surfaces. All clearly there is pressure involved because the volume decreases, but each time you get another thing. So it's clear that pressure needs to be generalized to something else. And this is very well known in literature. It's known since hundreds of, hundreds of years. It's called stress and strain. It's, uh, and if you want to look it up, it's the theory of elasticity. And it turns out, so and this is in a, in a nutshell, it's just in two slides. I'll give you just the main results of that, that uh, what we in everyday life uh, call pressure is actually something which is called strain. And it's a three by three matrix, it's diagonal. And uh, for example, for this diaphragm deformation, uh, this uh, st uh, strain um, uh, matrix is diagonal. It has same coefficient along the along, along the di diagonal. Uh, if you do this deformation, I showed you before, so you change just change the dimension in one dimension. So this is, everything is zero except the one coefficients. And if you choose the z-axis uh, vertical, then it's the um, u33, which is non-zero. And the third thing, you don't, you don't change the volume, but just change the angle, and then the diagonal is zero, and you have just two elements um, uh, which are non-zero. So remark that one of the results of this, of, of, of this calculus is that the trace, that means the sum of the diagonal element, is just the volume, volume change. So this is stress, that's in other terms pressure, or oh, excuse me, uh, the deformation, and now we come to stress. So uh, stress is also a matrix. It's a three by three. It's also symmetric, and you have, so this involves at some point, of course, forces to a certain surface. So when you go from this to this, it turns out that this stress matrix is diagonal, and the coefficients along the diagonal are equal. And this is a number which we call in everyday life pressure. So this is called hydrostatic pressure. Now you can have a different one. This is the, uh, apply the pressure just in one with the forces in one direction, then you get uh, a matrix which is 
which looks, looks like that. So the diagonal is all of them is zero except one of them. This is what we call doing actual pressure. And finally, uh, you can uh, apply the forces uh, also on a surface, but not perpendicular. Uh, and then you get uh, such a stress matrix. So um, this, uh, the, 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 this is, is can seen, but by, by non-diagonal, uh, uh, it's called shear stress. So it shows up in non-zero uh, elements in of the, uh, the the diagonal. So I, rem I recall the hydrostatic pressure is just that uh, uh, a, a diagonal uh, stress matrix with one number, which is called hydrostatic pressure. So nevertheless, if you have uh, any stress matrix, then you can extract a, a hydrostatic uh, component. And this is just the trace of this matrix when divided by 1 over 3. Yeah, you can try it with this one, you make the trace, the sum is 3 minus 3 p to divide by 3 is just minus p. And of course, between stress and strain, there is a relation, this is Hooke's law, and uh, there is another tensor involved in that, and this contains all the elastic properties of the material we are, which, are looking, which you are looking for. Uh, for a homogeneous and isotropic medium, there are just two, uh, two numbers. This is, for example, the bulk modulus and the shear modulus. Okay, so what should you remember from this? What we call pressure in everyday life is actually uh, a more complicated object. It's a, a tensor, a three by three tensor. It's called stress. Uh, and pressure in physics means almost exclusively hydrostatic pressure. So that means a stress tensor in this form. So this is uh, something, import something important you should take away from here. For example, our uh, colleagues from theory, uh, how do they determine pressure? They take the energy they calculate and uh, take the partial derivative of the volume, and this is the pressure. This is a thermodynamic uh, relationship. So I've got the P, which involves here, is, force, is, is necessarily hydrostatic pressure. So if you measure something and you want to compare it with theory, then you have to do it under hydrostatic conditions. Also, the definition of the bulk modulus, it implies hydrostatic pressure. So it's, it's never said, but it's impl it's in, it's, it, is a, it, it is implicitly contained in that. So finally, I would say is there is maybe, uh, it is maybe a good idea in your future career, if you want to stay in high pressure, to spend a few days in the theory of elasticity, because you can learn a lot of that also for <laughs> Uh, looking at crystals and also um, learning about the mathematic, mathematics behind it, which is basically tensor uh, algebra. Okay, so now we come to more hand uh, subjects which are more hands-on. So primary pressure scales. What is a primary pressure scale? It is a scale which is based on the thermodynamic definition of pressure. So it doesn't involve anything else, just thermodynamics. At one point or the other, it always get, will come back to, the, to this definition, force divided by surface. And this is a machine which allows you to calibrate um, pressure devices and give you really a, uh, uh, an absolute uh, value of the pressure which is consistent with the definition of, of thermodynamics. So why does it work? So it's commercially available. These machines, it's called the high pressure balance. So uh, it's some sort of balance. You have a, a, a way. You have, this is a weight, so it, which is calibrated. So this is uh, something which you can uh, calibrate to something like a milligram. Uh, you have a kilogram with a milligram, so you have an enormous precision. That applies. That gives you the force, and the surface is given by a the the the, the cross section of a little piston here, which is inside. So the, the, there's a liquid which you push up there, and uh, this lifts eventually. This uh, this this weight. So now we say, how how does how can it work? Because um, there's a piston, there's a cylinder, and there's f necessarily there is friction in it. So th what I measure must be wrong. No, it is not, because um, the tolerances between the, the the piston and the cylinder is so small that you don't need a seal. The friction will always appear when you have a seal, but there is no seal in it. So that means that the torus are typically in the micrometer. So this is a mechanical problem here, how to machine this, this, such things that is only a, a, 
that you have a tolerance of only one micron, and this one micron, you have, the, the, the fluid can't, can't leak out. It will leak loud, loud a little bit, but on the time scale of this experiment, you, it, it will not leak. So this is the, the so the, the, the accuracy of this is typically 10 to the minus four. So if you go to uh, large scale uh, facilities, they have lots of pressure transducers. At one point they have to calibrate it and they buy such machines and then they calibrate it. But you, you realize the, the, the limit is about five kilobars. Why? Because a piston cylinder de device doesn't work very much to beyond one GPI as we just have heard from Konstantin. So you can, you can uh, crank the pressures a little bit up, but then it becomes really difficult. So this is a high pressure balance to three GPA. Three GPA is the limit of a piston cylinder device. We have heard it from, from uh, Konstantin a minute ago. So you know, uh, that's still the same thing. You have a, some weight which is not shown here. You put it on, on top of that. You have a piston which, uh, which glides through a cylinder and you have the, uh, your uh, low pressure side, the, 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 the machine which you want to calibrate uh, or your experiment connected to one side. Again, this problem is uh, no friction between a, a piston and the cylinder. And you can imagine that this is very complicated. I have never seen such a machine actually. That need, it's technically difficult, you can't buy it. Uh, and it has high exploitation costs. Because basically, you would need a, a person which is devoted to that. Now, this is impossible, of course, to do that in, a, in, in an experiment. If, when you have an experiment, uh, uh, you don't want to have measure pressure with such a with such a complicated machine. Yeah. So, and for this reason, uh, people have invented secondary devices. So, the secondary devices they don't rely on the thermodynamic. Uh, uh, definition of pressure, but they have been calibrated once in their life to a primary primary gauge, and they are more adapted to your specific experiment. Uh, imagine you have a diamond anvil cell, and you want to make pressure inside. You will never be able to do it with this with this machine, even if you want to want to work only to two GPA. How do you connect this to a diamond anvil cell? So now I will go through a number of, prime, of secondary pressure gauges. So all of the, the, the pressure gauges you will uh, use in your future career are secondary pressure gauges. So the most simplest, you know it from your, from your home probably, it's just the, the famous bur uh, burden gauge. So this is something, when you go in a lab, it's the first thing that you see, something like this, usually this size. Uh, how does it work? Inside, probably you never opened one, uh, there is a tube, which is a, in form of a, of a hemisphere, um, a hemicircle, and it's, it's, it's a tube, so it's, it's hollow inside, and uh, you inject the pressure of inside there, and it will deform. And this def deformation is picked up by a mechanical mechanism, and then uh, transferred to a pointer, and this po pointer gives you the pressure once it's calibrated. Um, now, probably you know only these small devices, but there are big devices of this. For example, these are the famous Heise gauges. So they go to six kilobars. You can have some, some go, which goes up to 10 kilobars. They are big. You, you see here, this is, a pit, this is a pen. So these things are large like this. And they are surprisingly accurate because uh, you, there, you have a reading, a reading position of two, bar, uh, two bars because there is a, uh, there's a mirror behind it. So you, you, you avoid the effect of uh, parallax uh, errors. Now, this is a bit uh, cumbersome, yeah? So for this reason, and it's also quite expensive, by the way. So for this reason, uh, okay. <laughs> for this reason, people have, have invented uh, pressure gauges which are more compact and easy to use, especially with the uh, uh, with progress in computer science, and so you want to read it off automatically, and so on and so on. You want to go home and then have a, in the evening, and then have an auto autom automatic uh, uh, data collection. So this is the so-called pressure transducer gauges. So this is, I guess, you have seen it as well. So it's a small device, uh, maybe about 10 centimeters long, and again, probably you never opened it because you can't open it. Uh, this is, uh, what is it? It says inside there is basically a membrane which separates the electronics which is behind it from uh, the rest, from your, 
from your fluid, yeah, this, these things probably, obviously are only connected with fluid or gases. And then there is an element which is sensitive to pressure. What, what is it? Is either the, for, typically this is the resistance. There's, a, there's some uh, strain gauge inside. So this can be easily converted into, uh, into, into pressure once it's calibrated. So these things are calibrated then with two primary gauges. Or you, there's also ways to measure the, the changes of uh, capacity uh, uh, inside of these. Accuracy is typically 0.5%. So maybe you have a look at this numbers. I always quote accuracy. So it's, you, you will see we'll always, as the pressure goes up, this accuracy drops. So we are 10 to the minus 4.01%. Now we are 0.5%. So here is something uh, uh, which is not so popular th th these days, but it's quite useful. And this is the, for the famous manganin wire gauge. Now what is it? It is, uh, it relies, so manganese is, is, is an alloy. It's a, um, an alloy, basically copper and 40% manganese. And Bridgman, a long time ago, discovered that the resistivity of this material changes by, with about 2.3% per GPA. So you can use the change of the resistivity to measure pressure. So what is, how you do is in practice, you have a wire which is about 10 centimeters and you make a small coil because your pressure cell is usually small. So you make a small coil and then you, here's an example, and uh, then you, have, you put it inside your pressure cell, then you have to have, of course, some feed-throughs, electrical feed-throughs, and in, 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 in the general case, it's four feed-throughs because of the change in resistivity is small. And this is the most difficult thing. Yeah, you have to make these feed-throughs, so, but there are recipes, uh, and uh, then you measure just the re resistivity and to, to, to convert it into, pre into pressure. So what is the advantage of this? It's very cheap. Um, it's also quite quick. So people do uh, dynamic measurements of that. So it's a response time, so certainly less than a millise milliseconds. Uh, it's inexpensive, and it can be made very small. And it's uh, today used largely by the community who works with uh, clamp cells. In a clamp cell, you put your sample here inside. It's a piston, a piston cylinder uh, cell uh, with a type of Constantin showed one, and you need a feed through for the feed throughs for this wire, for these um, manganin wires. So you clamp it, you apply a force, clamp this force, and then you you use the cell, for example, to measure. Uh, uh, physical properties as a function of, uh, of temperature. Mm -hmm. So uh, the, the inconvenience of this is that uh, these coils need to be prepared. Mm -hmm. So it's not the, the, to make the coil itself, but it's basically the, the feed-throughs. And yes, also when you uh, bend these, the, the, the wire, then uh, the uh, resistivity changes, and you have to anneal this again. So this is what's known, is known since Bridgman. You have to need it as a pr procedures. There are recipes how to do that. It needs some handwork. And uh, since handwork becomes less and less popular in the society, these pressure gates, gauges depend, uh, become less and less popular as well, despite the fact they are very cheap. So next, a pressure gauge, which you may find mostly those of you who work with large volume devices, is uh, so-called fixed points. The idea is I use the transition in a, in a pure or substance or a comp compound, a well-known well compound, and uh, as, as a pressure gauge. So that gives you not a continuously reading of, uh, of pressures, but just certain points. Yeah? And uh, for example, you could use the uh, melting point of water, for example. The melting point of water is very well known as a function of temperature, of course. You have to, uh, or, or, or uh, mercury. The, mercu the, the, the mer melting line of mercury has been determined to a very high precision. So you can use this, and then, of course, you have to detect the melting point. Uh, how do you do this? You can do it volum volumetrically or electric. By um, electrical measurements, so the f well, probably the most famous fixed point is the Rose one from Bismuth. So this is a phase diagram of Bismuth. So this goes to 50 kilo uh, 50 kilobars. This is temperature, and you see when you are at ambient uh, temperature and you compress it to so about 25 kilobars, there is a phase transition. In which if you measure the resistivity, you see there's a drop by uh, 
we go at least a factor two of the resistivity. It's a very sharp drop, and it allows you to define um, the, uh, to, to measure the pressure because it's, it's so so sharp. And this has been calibrated. For example, this uh, this mode transition is 25 kilobars. You remember I showed you this. A pressure balance which goes to three GPA, so this, this three, G, this 25, this transition was calibrated directly with to a to a primary gauge, and there are fixed points which which which, which are at higher pressures. For example, uh, there is a, a, a transition of lead. This is the famous transition from FCC to HCP lead with a 13 GPA. So where do people use this? This is used for uh, multi-anvil applications. So uh, you know, remember, multi-anvil is a big devices with large volumes, and you want to maximize the, the sample volume because these people want to synthesize materials, and therefore they want to have a lot of materials. They don't want to sp to, to 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 include a, a, a pressure sensor inside there. So the way they work is they determine pressure by the load on the anvils. This is a little bit dirty job, but this is the way that it is, it is done. You don't measure the pressure in C2, you measure the pressure just by measuring the force, and then you have some calibration line. And this is a calibration curve. Yeah? If you, you, for example, at 400 tons with a certain um, um, as, uh, experimental setup, you ha it has always been the same, of course, otherwise you can't reproduce, uh, reproduce it. At 400 tons, you have eight GPA, so you rely on this. But at one point, when the, the pressure cell is delivered, or if you change the setup to all these, what is inside, then you have to recalibrate it. And how do they do this? They do this with this fixed point. So they, they, here, here they measure what force do I need to go to 2.5 GPA. Then you have a point here, then you have a point here, and a here, and they have three points. They can put a line through it, and that's, that's it. Okay, so now we come to optical pressure gauges. So this is something which is, of course, very popular now. Why it's popular? Because uh, many, so many people use diamond anvil, anvil cells. Probably half of the people here use diamond anvil cells. And uh, the success of optical uh, pressure gauges goes with the success of the diamond anvil cell. So uh, these are mostly flor fluores fluorescence uh, methods. Uh, you can ch you, in principle, you can ch use any optical property which is sensitive to pressure to, to determine pressure. But the, the fluorescence technique is the most famous. So in particular, the ruby fluorescence gauge. So I will spend some time on this because it's important for you, for your, for your career. So ruby. So ruby is a mineral. It's alumina with a little bit of cr chromium in it. It's naturally in in, it, in, uh, in, 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 in surfaces. So there's nothing else that's sapphire. If you take a piece of sapphire, you will find some chromium in it in the PPM level. So and the chromium goes on the aluminum side. And uh, that uh, uh, makes fluorescence. And what is fluorescence? So here is the energy scheme of uh, chromium inside uh, alumina. So at the, uh, I don't know if you are familiar with, uh, with these uh, schemes. So on the left si side you see the free iron. So these are the energy levels of the free iron. And then you build this iron into the solid and then you get a uh, band, okay, like band structure and then you end up which is here on the right. So you see uh, there are bands which absorb light into green. This is this U band and in the blue. Yeah, this is the energy. So this is typically 500, uh, 400 uh, nanometers, and this is something like 500 non nanometers or 600. And what? So this is this makes ruby red, yeah, because it absorbs them in the blue. So what you get is something, uh, is something red. And what happens with this? You excite. So you you shine a laser on it, or, or just daylight, uh, and you you, ex you excite uh, the um, the electrons to. Uh, to, uh, to the either the green or the or, or the blue uh, level, and then it decays afterward. It wants to get back at, uh, at where it was, but it can't go go back directly. Most of the most of the decay is non radiate radiative, and it, it it populates a certain level which is called E2, and this level has a long lifetime. So this is a typical fluorescence uh, story. It's a long lifetime. So if you pump uh, sufficiently in it, you get a an inversion of the population. Not normally, you would expect in thermal equilibrium, you want a bolt, you, 
you, you expect Boltzmann uh, um, uh, um, uh, uh, Boltzmann distribu distribution, but, of, uh, but, but here you have an inversion. This is a, the physics of lasers. It's based on it. So anyway, this um, level lives about a few milliseconds, and then it drops back to, um, to its ground state, and it, it, it emits light, and since the, uh, the, the, the E level is, is split, this is due to the spin-orbit coupling, it gives you two lines, R1 and R2, and it turns out that these lines are pressure dependent, so it have a positive pressure dependence, and it changes by 0.3 nanometers per GPA. You should remember this number is quite not only for your life, but also for this for this course, because there might be a question at one point in the school <laughs> about. <laughs> so anyway, it's a useful number to know: 0.3 nanometers per GPA. So. Uh, we can use this as a, as, a pre, as a pressure gauge, and this brings me to the famous 1986 calibration by Mao and co-workers, the so-called quasi-hydrostatic scale. I'm sure you will hear about in the, in the EHPLG conference about this. So this is the original data. You will see this three times in my talk. So what you he see is here is the pressure in kilobars. You can't read it probably. It goes to something like 800 kilobars, so it's quite, quite high pressures. And this is the shift of these lines, uh, basically. Well, usually you take just one line, so R1 line. And you see at the beginning, it's, it's linear, but when you go more, over 300 kilobars, then it, it bends over a little bit. So the coefficients I go, gave you uh, one slide before, it's just the initial slope. If you go to, the, to more than a few hundred, hundred kilobars, it's bent, and you take this Relation. This was uh, proposed by Mao. Now, if you look at this formula, is this familiar familiar to you? It's the equation. It is the Mornigan equation. Yes. So this is by pure guess. It's a, it's, it, it, it's it's not at all uh, logic that uh, the shift of a fluorescence line has a Mornigan equation it follows a, a, a Mornigan uh, law. But it turns out that it fits quite well within the precision of the measurements. So here are the coefficients. And this is used in most of your software where you now can buy to measure pressures. So most of the people use this here. We will come back later about how accurate it is. So here are some, uh, some properties of this fluorescence lines which you will probably see in your life. The first thing is to remember there is a strong temperature dependence, uh, both in the line shape and in the relative intensity. Here is on the, on the bottom, you see the two lines. This is at ambient temperature. You, you cool down and you don't look at it. And then and when you are low temperature, you switch again. It, it, you see something is wrong. No, it's, it's, it's getting very sharp. And one of the lines, the R2, disappears. It, it has to be disappears because it's a two-level state, and at, at zero temperature, obviously, it's only the lower level which is populated, and the high energy level is, is Boltzmann. It's again Boltzmann. And it, goes, it also sharpens considerably, yeah, because uh, the, the, the decay doesn't, uh, low temperature doesn't uh, uh, involve photons anymore. So, and then, which is, which is a bit of annoyance, there is also a temperature shift. Here is, you see the temperature shift. Maybe you, can, you can't see it in the, in the back, uh, but so there's wave numbers as a function of, of, of temperature. You see there is a, a considerable temperature uh, uh, shift in, 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 in the position, and this you have to take into account of that. So it doesn't, the coefficient alone doesn't help, help you. You need also the, um, the position at a certain temperature. And another thing which is a bit uh, a disadvantage is as you go to megabar pressures, the, it's getting more and more difficult to excite the fluorescence. Yeah? In uh, other words, the, the ruby loses more and more, 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 more of, its, of its color. And this is uh, what you see here. So uh, on the bottom here, these are the two bands I showed you, the green and, and the, the, the blue ones. This is the one, the bands which absorb the laser lights and from which on uh, the, 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 the excitations decay. So if you have a blue laser, for example, or a green laser, let's say a green laser, you are right on top of that and you can nicely excite it. 
But under pressure, of course, these bands go also up. And then uh, here, for example, you had 34 GPA, so in the green, la the green uh, laser is just out of this window. You can't excite anymore the, 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 the ruby. So when you come to a megabar, it's get, getting really difficult. You need a blue laser and so on. And um, we will see beyond 1.5 1, 1 me megabar, you, you, you probably switch to another, to, to another uh, probe. Practical aspects. This is maybe, <laughs> maybe in your, if you start your PhD as a diamond angle cell, you will fight with this. Now, the, uh, the, 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 the real great thing with Ruby, uh, with Ruby is easy to get. Actually, you can find it any, almost anywhere. Why? Because uh, there are lasers made of, of Ruby, so you have a large single crystal. By my PhD, uh, for example, I just took an old laser and broke the, broke the, 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 the Ruby inside and had a little, little chip. It is also, a, uh, it's easy to have a single crystal, and this is important for diffraction experiments. If you uh, have a single crystal, then you don't want to pollute, if you do a diffraction experiment, you don't want to pollute your diffraction uh, pattern with, with, with the ruby. Uh, but if you have a single crystal, then the, all the diffraction will be in certain, only in certain spots, which you then can easily eliminate in the image plate you, 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 you collect. So it's a low Z uh, material, it's, it's chemically inert, so that's also something uh, important. And uh, it's a really a strong, it gives you a strong um, a fluorescence. It's so strong that you can work today with so extremely small uh, uh, ruby chips, so in order of a micrometer. And it is useful to have these, these spheres. You can get them uh, as spheres, and because then you can easily recognize it. You don't have to search for hours, where is my ruby? And probably it's covered a little bit with, in, in, in your, in your, with, with your sample. Um, and the optical, the optics behind has become extremely simple. I remember when I made did my PhD, it was a complicated thing. You had to have a, a big laser and an argon ion laser. Then the optics behind was expensive and so on, because you need a, you need to you need a spectrometer to uh, analyze the the, 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 um, the, the flu fluorescence light. T today it's like that. This is a, a little setup I, which I have it in my lab. It allows you to measure the viscosity, for example. So uh, the laser is just one of these laser pointers. Yeah, I when my PhD I paid uh, something like twenty thousand German marks just for a laser. Now it's a, it's something like a, like fifty euros or so. <clears throat> then you have fiber, so you you have some optics of your fiber, and this is the spectrometer. The spectrometer now fits into your hand, so this is just great. And it's relatively cheap, so you can travel with it. Okay, now we come to the important question: How precise is the ruby scale? Yeah, I, d uh, I mean. Uh, it, I, I'm speaking about accuracy. I don't, you can measure shifts to within 50 bars of this, of this, but uh, that doesn't mean anything. Now, how, how, how can, what is the precision, the absolute precision of the Ruby scale? And here is a useful plot. Again, many of these plots come from a, an article by, uh, by Karl Schassen. So on the bottom you see the relative frequency shifts, shift of the ruby or R1 line, and here you see the pressure. So you shift the ruby uh, maybe by 5%, the, 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 the fluorescence line, you go to 2 megabars. And the famous Mao 86 scale is marked by these dashed lines here. And um, these other ones are previous scales, which are only of historical um, importance. But what is red is a, a range of new calibrations. And you see, uh, it is clear that the Mao 86 uh, calibration is wrong, or inaccurate uh, at, in, in the megabar range. And it is, so the conclusion, but initially, uh, all of the so it's, if it goes to 200 kilobars, everything is okay. All the different proposals uh, agree. Uh, but the problem arises here beyond 50 GPA. So uh, it is clear today that if you go into the megabar range, then the Mao 86 scale underestimates the pressure by probably 5 to 10 percent. So and these are these 5 to 10 percent of the corrections. So then you when you ask, well, when why don't we correct it then? Why is not somebody says, oh, now we, we redefine it? It's a problem 
uh, with people uh, because uh, there are maybe a dozens of new proposals, but they can't, uh, they can't agree on one proposal to go on with. And the reason is there is not the experimental evidence to distinguish one or the other of the calibrations is very weak. You see the difference is very small. And, and it's not clear if you choose one of them, you did one. Uh, so that's basically, we, did, we need better data. And then we, in the future, we could probably decide which one is the best one. So at the moment, there is no consensus, but there are a lot of propositions. We will just go on and work with the model 86 scale. So this was the Ruby scale, but uh, there are other uh, fluorescence uh, compounds. And uh, so why, why do you want to change Ruby against against something else? Because uh, well, I told you that that's very useful. Ruby has all the advantages. Now, Ruby has some disadvantages, and one of the disadvantages is that the pressure shift, yeah, this is this 0.36 nanometers per GPA, which you know now by heart, is it's a bit weak. So if you work, so if you go to megabars, that's okay. But if you um, work maybe with the 10 kilobar range, then it's really weak uh, because the shift is small. So you may want to have a, a fluorescent scale a gauge which is more sensitive. And the other thing, which is the annoyance I told you about, is uh, it has a strong temperature dependence. So you always have to correct temperature dependence. So therefore, people really, uh, were searching for better gauges alternatives to Ruby, and I cite two of them, there are many others, but those are the most popular. So to get rid of this temperature dependence, uh, people designed a compound with a strontium borate, this is SRB407, and the uh, fluorescent uh, element is no longer chromium, but it's samarium. So you can build in the samarium, I think it goes in the strontium side, and it makes fluorescence. Then it makes only one line, it's a sharp line, it needs to be sharp, and you see that the temperature dependence is close to zero. So this is a, 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 a fluorescence gauge which is extensively used by people who do high temperature, high pressure work in diamond metal cells. And they don't care very much about the uh, um, weak uh, pressure dependence of the, of, of the of the fluorescence line. It's in the same order of magnitude, but slightly smaller than, 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 than Ruby. Now, on the other, other hand, if you want to have uh, a large pressure coefficient, then there is another compound which is called a maclochite. Maclochite is also it's a mineral. It is barium fluoride, fluorine chloride. And again, it's uh, doped with samarium, so always in the percent level. And this has a large um, 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 pressure coefficients, which is about three times larger than that of, of Ruby. So if you do in the future uh, work in the 10 kilobar range or so, that this would be a, a pressure gauge, which is uh, very useful. It's also a one single line, it's a sharp line, and the only inconvenience is that it's a bit hard to get this material. Right. So now uh, there is another uh, optical gauge, and this is the famous diamond edge optical scale. So this is basically used by people who work in ab above 500 kilobars. So the idea behind that is to use the diamond of your diamond cell as the pressure gauge itself. So for some reason you can't use uh, the ruby, you can't use anything else, most probably because you have lost everything. You can't see the ruby anymore, you uh, you have another, another uh, you, you, you can't do the diffraction, but you can measure Raman. So if you can measure Raman and you have nothing else to measure uh, anymore because you are at 2 megabars, for example, you can use this. So what's the thing is uh, uh, diamond has an, a Raman active mode. It's about 1330 centimeter minus 1. And of course it shifts under pressure. So at 0 GPA, it's a sharp line. And if you uh, would focus your uh, your Raman spectrometer on the on the, on the QLED, you would see a, at zero pressure you would see a sharp line. But if you if you are at pressure and focus on the just on the on the QLED, on the surface of the QLED, then you will see that this peak is is not a peak; it's a it's a band. And the reason for that is because the, the part of the of the angle which is 
which is in direct contact with the sample, yeah, it's, it's the front edge. But your focus, it goes... It, go, it goes into the anvil as well, and the anvil itself is at lower pressures. And this gives you the back edge. So at, uh, for example, 235 GPA, you have a huge uh, band, with, but with relatively sharp edges. So when you can use this edge to determine the pressure. It's a bit of a dirty job, but uh, it's better than nothing, especially if you have nothing else to measure. And a nice thing, there's a, a rule of thumb. You take this, the width of that, so the, the difference between the front and the back edge, and you, you express this in centimeter minus one, and divide it by two when you have the pressure in GPA. For example, here, yeah? You had 1,350 or so, and you had 1,750. So you had a 400 centimeter minus, minus 1. You divide by 2. You, you guess just by bare eye, you are at 20 GPA, and that's true, you are at 23 GPA. OK, but the, the recommendation is use the diamond edge only when you have nothing else to measure. Diffraction uh, uh, pressure gauges, three minutes. Three minutes. <laughs> <laughs> then I need a second talk. <laughs> so, okay, I'll, I'll hurry up. I start with the famous Decker equation of state. So the Decker equation of state is a lookup table. It gives you the, vol the pressure at a certain volume change. So this is the Decker equation. <laughs> you don't need to, 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 to uh, learn these numbers by, by heart. Uh, it's a lookup table. It's a, 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 a semi-empirical that the Decker was a, was, is a sort of theorist. He take, took a potential yeah, uh, for, a, for an ionic solid. It's easy to express the bulk modulus in, as a function of, a, of a, if you have a potential. And he adjusted the parameters to, to fit the, the, the measurements. So this is an old, an old lookup table. There's a new lookup table. This is Brown's 99 uh, um, um, scale. You see. This, this, this use more recent experimental data, that there is a difference up to 3%. So the Decker equation is probably wrong by typically in the percent region. Why do I mention this? Uh, because uh, the Decker equation is strongly tied to the root scale. The initial slope, actually, so you, you know this plot I showed you a minute ago, uh, the initial slope in this calibration was forced to be, uh, uh, to be consistent with the, with the Decker equation. So each time, this is an important information you should take away from it. Each time you measure the ruby, you use the Decker equation. And the Decker equation is probably wrong by at least a, a percent. So what are other diffraction um, gauges uh, which are more popular, but the problem is that the, 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 the NA sail makes a phase transition at 35 GPA, so you can't use it anymore. So more popular uh, um, equations of states are metals. Uh, this is mainly for, for X-ray diffraction. There's a, a lot of choice because metals, certain metals are stable to into a megabar range. They don't make phase transitions. The advantage is you don't have any more a lookup table. You have just three parameters, which is the bulk modulus. It's the derivative. Volume at zero pressure, and this you plug in it into an equation of state. For example, this Birch Mannheim equation, the Ravini Rittberg equation of state, and you determine the pressure by this. So, primary standards larger than 3 GPA. I, I told you that there are no primary standards beyond 3 GPA because there are no balances uh, which you can construct along 3 GPA. So, one idea is the following. You see the definition of the bulk modulus. So this formula, you can integrate it. And this would give you the pressure. So imagine you can measure the volume of a sample, and at the same time, its compressibility, in, in other words, the bulk modulus, by some, some technique. Then you just integrate it, and you get the pressure, without ever measuring the pressure by another, by another method. Yeah, you just measure volume and compressibility and you have the pressure. And this is an absolute pressure scale because it involves only thermodynamic, um, only thermodynamics. So how is that possible? Yes, it is. Because the volume nowadays in a circuit is also can measure it to 10 to the bound and minus 4 precision. So the volume you have, you, you have it. And it turns out that the, that the, the bulk volume is you can also measure it to, to, to very high precision, precision by ultrasonic measurements. And ultrasonic measurements, you measure the travel time across a sample, times you can measure in the in almost indefinite uh, uh, 
precision. Length as well. So this gives you a precision of 10 to the minus 4. With the integration in that, you could in principle get a, a, an absolute pressure scale in the beyond 3 GPA with high precision. What's the problem? The problem is that the ultrasonic measurements give you the not the isothermal bulk modulus, but the, uh, the, but the adiabatic bulk modulus. And to get it back to the isothermal bulk modulus, you have to correct it. And you, this involves the Grüneisen parameter and the thermal expansion. And the Grüneisen parameter is unfortunately not very well known to it within the 10 percent. So anyway, <coughs> it is feasible, but accuracy is limited by the precision of other thermodynamic parameters, for example, the Grüneisen parameter. But certainly there is the perspective to have absolute pressure scale beyond 100 kilobar that is uh, that's necessary. There are groups working on that with large volume devices because you can, this is a method which works only with uh, samples of, uh, in the millimeter size. So this is my last almost last, last slide, this is shockwaves. So there are experts here in, in, in the back who can tell you more of that. In shockwaves, what you measure is, shockwave measures very short, of course, but what you measure are... Sp and the speed is, and density, from the speed you derive density and pressure, pressure. This is the, the rankine hugonia equations. So this is the, this U are speeds. It's the speed of the shock front and the speed of the particles behind. So again, you can measure speed with principle, almost indefinite precision. So that you can get the pressure in megabar ranges with uh, just by thermodynamic arguments. The problem is there are conferences on that that these need to be reduced because they are on a, they are not isothermal, they are not adiabatic. Uh, so there are recipes to do that, but of course that degrades your uh, your precision. Okay. This is the the way how the, the MAU 86 scale was calibrated because the data up in the 800 kilobar range were determined by shock waves. So at low pressure it was the, the Decker equation, at high pressure it was the shock wave data. Okay, well that is general uh, consideration and uh, um, Jose Manuel, give me, give me two, one, one minute to take. It is an accuracy in everyday life. What is the accuracy you you, you, you are asking for in everyday life for certain quantities. For example, the mass. You go to a butcher and you say, I want one kilogram of meat. So what is the accuracy you ask? The accuracy, the accuracy you ask is a gram. Yeah? The, the butcher's uh, balances are, have to be calibrated. Otherwise, their, their, their shop has to close. So it's one gram. It's one, uh, a tenth of a percent. Temperature, it's a tenth of a Kelvin, yeah, because it makes a big difference if you are, your body temperature is at 37 degrees or, or 43 degrees. At 43 degrees, you are dead. At length, it's the same. At one millimeter, you are, anyway, what any, uh, most of the measurements you hear, you ask for a pre precision of one millimeter, let's say, or one meter, point one percent. And in time, it's even worse. Uh, you ask an incredibly, incredibly high precision on time. You, you don't want to have a watch goes wrong by 1% uh, per day. You don't want that. However, in pressure, things seem to be different because the precision we ask in pressure is quite much lower. For example, at tire, you, want, you, you ask for a precision of 5% only. And in weather forecast, if you look at the, uh, at, at, at the pressure, it's also 1%. So there is something with pressure. Now you can say, that, well, this is everyday life, and so, but in science, we are much better. No, we are not better. The science, as I told you, the Decker equation is correct within 1%. So uh, we have only a procession of, 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 of a few percent. So each time when I see this equation of states where you measure volume by the synchrotron source as a function of pressure, you remember, you, they measure with incredible precision the volume, but the pressure is wrong by, by, by the percent level. Does that make sense? So, and then, High pressure metrology, is it a boring subject? This is something for your future. What do you want to go? So that we clearly need some people who go into the subject and, and look at that. Yes, it is probably a boring subject, but you can't, you, and on top of that, you can't make a career out of that. There will be no university in the world who will employ you and saying, well, I want to, to improve the pressure scale. Nobody will do it. However, there's a reward for that, and this is citations. 
And the citation when you, when you do high pressure metrology is just phenomenal. This is the paper I cited again. This is the Mao paper from 86. It gets about 100 citations per year. I can confirm that. My name is at a, on, on about 25 PRLs in a few natures. And, but the best, most cited paper is a little, a little is, written, is, is published in a little journal called the Journal of Applied Physics D. And I get one, I, I get one citation per week. So this is the reward. So this is something which you may want to consider in the future. Um, and then I'm, I'm really finished. Okay. Thank you. A couple of questions. Yes. What do you mean lower? Uh, yeah, the, the the oh, why? The oh, you lower. mean for example, uh, for example, in the Mao, uh, in the, uh, from the Mao scale, it's just. It, this is because the, the coefficients of um, uh, Mao and Bell choose at that time were such that uh, that, that in hindsight they are too low. It's just by pure incidence. Yeah, you can. There are people who just who correct it. For, the work by Agnes Davel, she changed one of the coefficients to get it to, to get it coined. It's one of the propositions, by the way. Taking into account the pressure gradients, yes, yes, how many <laughs> yes, this is a real, a real, it's a good question. Um, Pressure is medium, and I, I can't go very much in detail, but it is quite usual. If you, if you are beyond 100 uh, G, uh, GPA, you have pressure gradients typically of 10%. <laughs> it's unavoidable unless you do some laser heating, for example, to, uh, and there is a lot of rubbish um, uh, published on, on that. So let me give you one advice in your, for, for your career. You probably use ethylene methanol as a pressure transmitting medium. You measure something and something odd, something new, a new phenom phenomenon appears exactly at 10 GPA. So be careful with that. <laughs> be careful with that because at 10 GPA the ethylene methanol freezes. Use helium, yeah, but there it's uh, again. It is, it's it's a bad, helium is of course the best thing you can can use, yes. But it's no no safeguard. You even when there's pub, there's literature, you can if you are in a megawatt range, you will have pressure gradients. That's by the way in the paper I I cited. Yeah. Uh, if we don't use hydrostatic medium, pressure medium, yes. then this equation of state cannot be used at all, or yeah, in principle, no. So the question is how. They, uh, yeah, when they go to, when they establish this, this, this uh, when they established this uh, equation of state, what did they do? Now, well, they obviously did, did, a, did it to try to make a good job. They, they used helium. So, uh, within this constraints, this, uh, the, this equation of state is correct. But you can be easily, if you use other pressure medium, then you can easily be wrong by 20%. 